Hello, party people. My name is Krista Keo, and you're listening to Granted, the podcast that puts the fun in funding. Today, we're in the studio with the one and only Fiona Diamond. Fiona has reached legendary status as an influential leader in the arts and culture community in Atlantic Canada. She is a principal in Brooks Diamond Productions, and in her role as vice president, she works as a producer, promoter, project manager, and represents comedians and musical artists as well. I'm so excited to talk to Fiona today, and I can't wait to get to know more about her and the awesome work that she does. Thank you for being here with us today, Fiona. It's really great. Um... I have known about you. I've not known you, but I've known about you since I started working in just in business, not even in the music industry, which was about 20 years ago for me. But um, you have been working in some capacity in the creative industries for over 40 years now, which is a huge accomplishment in itself. Um, You've had roles in music and theater and dance and comedy. So... Where did your drive come from 40 years ago to want to work in the arts? First of all, I'd like to say I was five when I started. Wow. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Just put that right out there. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, it's been a long time, and I kind of grew up in the arts. Okay. My family was kind of involved in, particularly in theater, and I always loved it. I think at some point in my teenage years, I wanted to be an actress, and I did uh, do a bit of that. I studied theater in my first year of university, but then I... Um, I kind of realized what that life was all about and decided it really wasn't for me. But I always, I guess, knew I wanted to work in some capacity in the arts. And I was very fortunate uh, that one of my very early jobs was running programming and entertainment for uh, uh, Dalhousie University students. Okay. And it was my full-time job. And I had it for five years and I worked, I had an office in the student union building and I booked all the music, all the events, speakers, um, wow, all kinds of stuff all okay. over Dal campus. And it was fabulous. Wow. I did my very first concert ever in the Rebecca Cohen with John Lee Hooker. Oh, wow. I had never heard of him. Okay. <laughs> and he was quite the character. He actually uh, didn't want to go on stage at first. And I was very young, very new to this world and totally terrified. And I managed, I, I managed to talk him down off the, off the building. But um, yeah, he went on and did an incredible show. But oh, that's wow. how I got started. Wow. And so what is it about the arts that drives you? Is it because when you were young, you had such great experiences watching theater or seeing your parents enjoy or participating? Or is it just a natural kind of lead? All of the above. I actually, I think the power of the arts got into my, under my skin very early in life. And I've always... Uh, felt very passionate about their importance um, and how it can it can actually change people. It can change society. Um, it's it's just so important for mm-hmm. a good, healthy culture. Mm-hmm. And would you say that today that that's very similar? Those reasons are why you still pursue this work in the arts. Probably arts? more so because yeah. as I've gotten older and more experienced, I think I understand more and more how important uh, the arts are in for for a good, healthy society. Mm -hmm. Um, And I see it in Halifax, Mm -hmm. but I see it worldwide, too, Mm -hmm. globally. Right. So this podcast is about funding. And it's interesting because you and I had a call and we chatted a bit about the podcast last week. And one of the first things you said to me is that you don't like the word funding, and instead we should be saying investment. And I have heard that before. And so in your mind to you, what is the difference between saying funding and saying investment? And why is that important to differentiate? It's very important. Mm -hmm. The 
reason for me is that every penny that government or anyone, a company or a person puts into culture is benefiting um, both uh, the economic situation and the social situation. So I believe it's an investment. I don't, I, I think the, the word I really don't like is grant. Okay. Um, and obviously, it's, a, it's very commonly used all over the place and uh, researchers get grants and, um, and we get grants in the arts. But to me, it, um, it doesn't really reflect what's going on. Uh, by when government uh, gives money to an artist or to the arts or to a program, uh, they are investing in a better community. That's why they're doing it. They particularly want to see an economic benefit. But, you know, as we talked about, the arts, to me, has two very significant benefits. One is... Um, the economic benefit, and that's been shown uh, over and over again. But more importantly, perhaps, is the social benefit, what it can do to raise a society up um, to, you know, to make us a, a better a better society. Mm -hmm. To create a better place for us to live in, to Absolutely. enjoy. And to make us better people, right. to, to help us understand each other better. Um, and it, it happens, you know, it's been proven over and over and over again, how, um, you know, music can cut through differences and, and bring people together. It can, it can go right into your soul. Um, there's, there's very little else I can think of in society that does that. And so, um, but it also has a very clear economic benefit. Um, and it, you know, you can go to examples like, companies that want to move to your city mm -hmm. uh, want to know there's a symphony. They mm -hmm. want to know there's a theater. They want to know there's a vibrant music community or an, a visual art community or an art gallery. They want to know those things before they're prepared to make their investment to come into your community. I mean, that's a very mm -hmm. basic example. Yeah, but something that we don't think of um, because you think of arts and culture as your own, perhaps, but when you're right, when when we're trying to attract people to come here. That's a major part of who we are and the place that we live in. Our arts and culture um, is an attraction almost, and we should so sort of celebrate it um, because it's very valuable to people is yes. what you're saying. Yeah, and to the community. So in addition to representing people like comedians and artists, which you've done over the years and you still do that, you've been involved in some really big projects that have had very big impacts on the community and that have been exported to like drum is one example. It's a musical production that celebrates, would you say Nova Scotian culture and heritage or would it be the Maritimes or? Well, it's interesting yeah. because uh, we always saw it as the story of Nova Scotia okay. and it's kind of a, a based on the rhythms of the four or four of the founding cultures right. of Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. And we saw it as a way to uh, celebrate the distinctive, distinctiveness of those yeah. cultures, um, but show how when they come together, they're mm -hmm. one harmonious whole. Right. But uh, as we did tour it, um, uh, we toured it all over the U.S. and who... In most places, they had never heard of Nova Scotia, and yet it um, connected viscerally with people everywhere we went, without yeah. exception, I would say. Um, and the reason was because it was a, a, a piece of a much larger story, and there there are indigenous people across North America. There are black people across North America. There are people from European roots that have rhythms that celebrate their cultures, but we're all learning how to work together and play together and, mm -hmm. and understand each other. And that's okay. what drum does. It, okay. it, uh, it, it demonstrates how people can remain distinct, but still work and play and, and be together. Mm -hmm. um, but it also connects in a very visceral way 
which goes back to the fact that it's music um, mm-hmm. and dance, and mm-hmm. that has a connection to the heart, mm-hmm. to the soul, mm-hmm. that cuts through. I mean, we could talk about that all night, but but when people see it uh, and fe- they feel it, right. and they feel the rhythm. It's also very authentic because the people on stage are actually from those cultures. They had a big part in creating the show, and we were very respectful of those cultures. So, and and the the people on stage, these wonderful performers uh, who have grown over the years tremendously, um, all feel very very strongly about their cultures and. So when they're on stage, they feel they are representing their cultures. Right. That's so powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of your latest projects that you've worked on is the Sea Dome, which I guess could be described as a cinematic experience, right? And that's on the Halifax waterfront. And there's a whole film uh, uh, which is part of that experience, Mm -hmm. right? And can you tell us just briefly about that? Sure. So again, our... um, our incentive there was to tell Nova Scotian stories, and we're particularly interested in this case uh, about telling stories about our ocean and, and marine heritage, okay. because if you look at Nova Scotia, it's surrounded by water, mm-hmm. and that makes us very special, just like our culture. It's a part of our culture, mm-hmm. and so throughout history, it's had a, a massive effect on our heritage and our culture and the way we think, the way we act. Um, and I mean, we we are a military city. We had a, an incredible uh, history. Uh, Samuel Kennard came from here, and we used to be a gigantic shipping uh, center. Mm-hmm. Very, very wealthy. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so that has affected every part of our lives. So we were really interested to tell those stories. And um, we've always wanted to, I guess, go a little bit out of our comfort zone and look at new ways to tell stories. And so... Um, in the dome, we we use new technologies, digital technologies, to tell these stories, and we tell them very immersively. So it's a three hundred and sixty degree film. It's above you, it's around you, it's behind you, um, and so when you're in there, you experience uh, the story rather than just hear it or see it. Okay, that's fascinating. So, I mean, for these big projects like you've described, there's obviously a lot of investment that goes into it, probably especially in the beginning. Yep. So how have you been able to work with government to access funds for investments, for projects of that size, or perhaps projects that don't fit into the regular program? Like, you know, they fit into the box. They're very unique and very creative and very, you know, multidisciplinary too. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's your approach been to working with government to invest? Because you you see the value. We all know there's value there for the greater good, like we've talked about the arts and culture in general, and and this is part of it. So what what was your approach to that? It's been very, very challenging. Okay. Um, Very challenging. And you're uh, 100% correct. We've never fit into any box. And it's been hugely... Uh, troubling and um, sometimes extremely discouraging. But um, I guess uh, the approach has been we believe that what we're doing is important. Uh, It's important for Nova Scotia. It's important for Nova Scotians. Uh, And we feel it is, it does make a a huge difference. Um, Telling these stories and telling them in in innovative ways is it's it's important to governments too. I mean, sometimes they don't even realize it. But we were very fortunate um, in the last very recent past uh, that um, the culture action plan was written, and that has made a big difference, I think, in um, government, mm-hmm. because I think finally uh, the Nova Scotian government uh, has understood um, what we were talking about earlier, mm-hmm. the huge impact, both economically and socially, that mm-hmm. um, 
the arts and and our storytelling has. So um, that has um, enabled us to speak in their language and. Um, uh, but I, I would say over the years, it's been about partnerships, collaborations. You know, we've often partnered with people in the community that already had um, something going on or uh, were able to tap into some some government help. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think... I'm th- trying to think back. I mean, with the Comedy Fest, when mm-hmm. we got that idea, we went uh, to CBC. That's yeah. how that's how we did that because we knew people at CBC and we'd done music there forever and we said we went to them and said we got an idea and actually they bought into it right away. CBC's changed a lot since then. Yeah. So okay. uh, but you know yeah. the Comedy Fest has survived all those bumps and um uh you know I think it's thriving yeah. today. Mm-hmm. Um and uh with drum um we I have to say we talked to a lot of people in government who had a vision and we we did it we always sort of figured out a way to do it kind of through the side door and drum mm-hmm. actually started as a project for the um Atlantic Canada Tourism Partnership. Well, that's what I was interested in, too, Mm -hmm. is maybe perhaps did you get creative because it does impact tourism and hospitality Mm -hmm. and service-based businesses when you do something that attracts people to the province rather than what a lot of uh, funding is about an investment, which is about exporting, you know, and bringing in new money. But but you're – that's very clever. So in in thinking, okay, how is this project impacting – the bigger picture, and who can we talk to, who is going to be invested in this, who's going to care about this, who does this matter to. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned the Culture Action Plan, Mm -hmm. and I really like it. I feel like for me as a person working in the arts as well, it helped to – how can I describe this? It just helped to create a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. It helped make me feel like I was part of a bigger group of people who were working towards some of the same kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we work in silos. A lot of our work is digital. We don't see each other often. Um, So what can you tell me about that process? What was that like to do the Culture Action Plan? Um, And maybe you can tell me about some of the things that you advocated for in that plan that you really wanted to see and how that worked out. So the the plan came from the Department of Communities, Culture, and Heritage, um, the the idea and the process, and they uh, got a lot of input from the Creative Nova Scotia Leadership Council, which is um, a wonderful body uh, that um, is has representatives from really pretty wide um, uh, representation of cultural um, artists, industry, um, organizations, um, and ethnicities. Mm -hmm. It's a very diverse... Multiple disciplines, too. Multiple disciplinary, yes. And the idea of the council is... um, to advise on uh, policy um, for the department. And so, uh, and there's a a great um, number of different uh, viewpoints. Mm -hmm. um, And those viewpoints all kind of, again, collaborated. Mm -hmm. And I believe so, so strongly in collaboration. I I hate silos. I think that is the worst way mm-hmm. to operate and it it's very destructive and mm-hmm. um and I've always felt that the music industry in particular in Nova Scotia was very collaborative and I've mm-hmm. I think it's why we've done so well despite the many challenges okay, and yeah. we collectively I mean as yeah. um as an industry but so um it was a, a long uh haul and um, but uh, again, uh, the the department really was very very good at listening. Mm-hmm. Um, they actually went around the province and did uh, consultations with again as many community groups and uh, arts and culture and heritage groups as they could possibly uh, mm-hmm. find. And that was a long involved process. But mm-hmm. again, they got a lot of great great feedback. 
and um, eventually they they took all those wonderful um, ideas mm -hmm. and put it into a plan that could guide. And the uh, idea was that while it was led by the department, it would lead all of government in um, how they should understand culture and integrate it into government as a oh, whole. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Yes. That it was also for government and other... Yeah. So what right. was exciting for me was the launch at which the premier uh, came and announced the launch. And that really had never happened before in, in a cultural setting um, because... It was always perceived that culture was kind of over here to the side. Mm -hmm. um, but now I think it's recognized that culture is a central part of how, how government needs to operate. We need to recognize culture in everything we do. And we used to liken it to the environment. So oh. years ago, there was no such thing as environmental policy, but then all of a sudden, if you built a building, you had to look at the environmental impacts. So the idea of the culture action plan was, if you were going to build a building, you have to look at the cultural impacts of oh, that wow. building. Okay, How could that affect the culture of the city, the culture oh, of the province? Yeah. What? How could that benefit? What right, are like the, the nightlife? What is the attraction? Is it bringing yeah. people down? Is or it maybe accessible? even the visual... Uh, yeah. Look of it, you sure. know. Oh, the artistic, Absolutely. yeah, the architecture, and absolutely right. And so that's what I believe that that very strongly that uh, there has to be a, a, a cultural impact of everything we do mm -hmm. and a creative impact, mm -hmm. and um, y you know that there there are creative. I mean, one of the things we talk about is turning STEM into steam. So there's an organization of um, uh, in the math and sciences world, mm -hmm. um, and STEM is um, science, technology, engineering, and math, I think. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we believe it should be science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Oh. Because even in the sciences, even in health, uh, there's huge impact of culture in health. If you look at... Um, different uh, ethnicities and um, how their health affects them, mm -hmm. what it must be like to go to a hospital that, mm -hmm. you know, doesn't, isn't full of people that look like you or right. think like you or have mm -hmm. your values. So yeah. again, it needs to permeate every, every part of our, our society. And mm -hmm. I think that's what the, the plan uh, attempts to do. It's a starting mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. You know, we still have a long, long way to go. But yeah. I think it was a very good starting point, mm -hmm. very solid. Um, and going back to funding, mm -hmm. um, a couple of things that came out of that process were that um, the Department of Culture now has um, some grants um, that don't don't start with a box. Oh. Uh, they start with, you come to us with an idea and we'll help you see how we can fit it into right. a funding. Right. I don't even like to say box, but right. they're, they're thinking outside of the box right. and saying, you know what, if it's a worthwhile project, probably, especially in the creative world, maybe yeah. it doesn't fit in a box. Yeah. Maybe it's never been done before. So how do we, why do, how do we invest in that? Yeah. And so they actually, that's what the Creative Industries Fund that's is. That's what I was going to ask. Is that, yeah. are you thinking of that fund? Because that is like, what it is. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, that's so true. And um, I know Mickey Quays is leading that fund. Mm -hmm. And along with, uh, is, I believe, Susan Jeffries yeah, is in there correct. as well. Two wonderful people who have a lot of history. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember back when Mickey was also running the Emerging Music Business Program. Um, it was, there were, there was, you could get really creative with the programming as far as say the mentorship. The idea was sort mm -hmm. of like, you can create, if, if there's something you want to learn, you can create the curriculum for yourself and choose your mentor and you work out a plan and then you do it. And so the, with Creative Industries Fund now, I know in my work that I do with some clients, I know people say, oh, I've checked it out and I don't really understand it. It 
But what you're saying, which is making me look at it differently, is that it is not very specific because it's meant to be a fun that people go to with their creative ideas. Absolutely. And they it's more of a collaboration. Like what you say, yeah. Exactly. So you say, this is our project. You know, I've, uh, there's an artist and the artist is going on tour. Um, they're a very established artist, but say perhaps their record hasn't been out uh, it, or it's been out for more than two years. So, so they don't qualify for other typical funds, you know, where there's these rules of criteria and eligibility that are very strict. Um, but with Creative Industries, and there are a few others out there, Arts Nova Scotia has some too, where you can come with an idea and then collaborate, okay, what can government do to invest in this project and where and how, and then you do the other part. So do you think there needs to be more funds like that? Oh, yes. So that the drums across of the all world. Of, <laughs> across all of government. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, I, I think we, we talk about innovation all the time. That yes. word permeates uh, so much policy and government. And um, it's a talking point. You know, we need to be innovative. We need to get to the next level. Well, mm-hmm. how the heck do you do that if you got a box that says you have to be this, you have to be this, you have to be this. It doesn't make right. any sense. Yeah. So, um, you know, other than scientific research, mm-hmm. uh, it's very difficult to fit into that box when you're creating something brand new. Obviously, yeah. there has to be uh, some criteria. Sure. It has to it has to work to, um, let's say, government's policies and mandates and how they see the future unfolding. But I think... Um, it needs to be a little more creative mm-hmm. to really get to the folks that have uh, these, you know, really creative ideas. Yeah, I agree. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit um, because I want to know your thoughts on sort of where we're at as women in the music business and arts and culture because – um, there's more conversations now than ever in m- perhaps my time working in, you know, as an adult person, I would say, um, about equality for women we see in the States and in Canada, the Me Too and the Time's Up movements. But when you were starting your career in the late 70s, say, there were probably different kinds of issues to do with women and equality. And so can you give me an idea of what those challenges were then? Have we come a long way? Do you see bigger challenges ahead? What are your feelings on that? It's not something that I have to say has been a big factor in my working life. I think I was very fortunate to uh, – now I have to say when I first started in the business, uh, I had to spend a lot of time in bars – by myself right. because I was checking out bands okay. and that was not cool. And, you know, it was, uh, there I was standing and, you know, often I used to just try to get a friend to go with me or something, sure. but, you know, often I just was running around, you know, yeah. I'd go 10 minutes to watch this band and then run to somewhere else. Back then there were lots of bars with live entertainment, I must say. Okay. Um, so that was difficult and just trying to, um, I get, I guess, sort of have credibility because sure. it was really a man's world. Yes, I imagine. Um, and plus, when I started, I knew nothing. I really kind of talked my way into the job <laughs> big time <laughs> and didn't know a thing and had oh, to learn wow. really quickly and, you know, kind of learn just by doing. And uh, so it, it was um, it was hard, uh, but I never had a bad experience and I I really feel for women that have sure but just being like you're saying you know having because there were so many men dominating at that time Mm -hmm. the business yeah I'm sure that you've you came up against that um just being outnumbered and I've been in that situation too in boardrooms and things where you're just simply outnumbered and uh I I feel similar when I started out. I was coming from a different industry, totally like marketing and advertising, and I was in my late 20s at the time. So 
I knew even less then, and I was coming in at a point in my career where my peers had accomplished already so much in the music industry. So, But I think that is a un- universal feeling of women often feeling outnumbered, and maybe that it takes a bit more work to be taken seriously or to have your voice heard, I guess, too. I do think it's changed a great deal, That's though. Good. And yeah. I look at... Um, so many companies, you know, music companies, where women are have kind of taking over. I mean, mm-hmm. even in the in the actual record industry, mm-hmm. it used to be it was all guys and mm-hmm. it was a real old boys club. But now there's lots of women in there, mm-hmm. and um, lots of women, you know, presenters in halls, and mm-hmm. um, uh, so I, I see a lot. A lot more women um, heading companies and, and being strong. So I feel optimistic. And I think all those movements you spoke about have yeah. made a great deal of difference and, mm-hmm. you know, in just taking mm-hmm. us seriously. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I, I feel optimistic that, you know, uh, I do think it's important for us to support each other. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's always been the case. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, you know, frankly, um, you know, I don't like to be gender biased, but mm-hmm. I, I think there's a lot of things we offer that, you know, that mm-hmm. are innovative and yeah. cool and, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. I agree. And I think that I've seen that um, when you give women a chance or the times that I've even been given chances to do things and opportunities, I take it very seriously and I want to do very well. It's important to me, not just for myself, but because being given that one chance, you know, could lead to something else. And those chances, those first time chances don't come up all that often. So I think, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen women grow, um, faster maybe than I expected or, you know, are accomplishing huge things when they're given the opportunity. And it's really, it's really great. And also, that's good to hear you're optimistic. I think it's more comfortable now to bring it up to say like, hey, why don't we include some more women in this activity? Sure. Or, you know, why don't we think about, you know, even mothers and their role in taking care of families and how we can create an event that is more family friendly, even doing something like that. Um, That's great. So, you know, my final question that I wanted to ask you, and this might be a tough one, but you have contributed so much to arts and culture in Nova Scotia. And I want to know what you feel like for yourself has been your greatest contribution. Ooh. Yeah. Wow. Well, I I guess I'd like to feel that um, I've helped move Mm -hmm. the industry forward, Mm -hmm. um, that I've helped the East Coast Mm -hmm. have a louder voice Mm -hmm. across the country and the world. (laughs) That's not being too uh, overblown. But I I really, I mean, both Brooks and I have always, always wanted to promote East Coast artists you know okay. it's it's always been a thing with us and the east coast in general but mm-hmm. you know wherever we go it's it's all about mm-hmm. what we have here this paradise mm-hmm. on earth um and the talent that comes out of here and it's still here in right. in just you know overflowing yeah and um it's it's incredible mm-hmm. uh and so i i guess that would be it. Just, mm-hmm. just if 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 I've been able to shine a light yeah. on this wonderful part of the world and the incredible talent that's here, mm-hmm. um, and the importance of it mm-hmm. to the world, mm-hmm. I guess that would be it. <laughs> yeah, that's good, and that would be in, to you the success that perhaps that's probably it sounds like how you would describe success as being able to do that to shine a light on the talent here and the place where we live and things that's wonderful thank you for your time oh you're welcome it was a pleasure thank you Thank you for 
for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast wherever you like to listen to podcasts so you never miss a new episode of Granted. Produced by Chris Keo and John Mullane at John's Studio in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Follow us on social media. We are at Granted Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. And you can follow us on Twitter at Granted underscore podcast. Mm-hmm.